Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. A recent book kicked off with some chilling statistics. The U.S., it argues, is crime-obsessed. The number of people in prisons here skyrocketed. What are we policing in this country exactly? Our next guest argues that looking at the experience of people who are usually ignored in this story, namely gay, lesbian, transgender, and self-described queer Americans, gives some clues, or can about how we as a society construct our idea of crime and justice and safety. What are police for? Policing deviance, really? Is that what best serves a creative and vibrant country? And what about justice for LGBTQ people? Andrea Ritchie is a police misconduct attorney and organizer here in New York City. She coordinates Streetwise and Safe, a leadership project for LGBT youth of color and the book she co-wrote is Queer Injustice, the Criminalization of LGBT People in the United States. Welcome, Andrea. Glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. There's a lot of people paying attention to the criminal justice system these days, whether they're protesting stop and frisk or worried about stand your ground laws. Why do you call for attention to LGBTQ people? What's in it for us to learn? Well, for one, the reality of uh, the fact that among, for instance, the s almost 700,000 stops that were conducted in New York City in uh, 2011, the majority of whom were of uh, black and brown men, among those black and brown men are gay men or transgender men or bisexual men um, or transgender women who are being labeled as men and who are experiencing stop and frisk in many of the same ways as other members of their community, but also in ways that are unique to their experience. And whether it's being called a particular name, whether it's being uh, profiled for a particular offense, whether it's being um, harassed around what gender your ID reflects, uh, whether it's being sexually assaulted or harassed, um, those experiences are both similar and different, and it's important if we're going to address the complexity of the problem to have a full understanding of all aspects of so it. So what do some of those different ways reveal? Uh, they reveal that the function of law enforcement in the United States is um, to police uh, the lines or perimeters, as you would say, around sex and gender and around sex and sexuality as much as they are around race. And in fact, that the policing of sex and gender is an integral function of the policing of race and poverty. Has it's that an, always been true, you think? Since the moment Columbus first landed, at least as far as I can gather. Well, you mean that it's in the book? Literally, uh, the within a couple of uh, decades of Columbus landing, there's a documented instance of a conquistador uh, literally policing people's gender presentation and sexuality among indigenous people by setting their his dogs on them to kill them. And uh, it's definitely uh, sexual violence and policing of gender nonconformity and perceived sexual nonconformity was uh, both used as a tool of colonial domination, but but also as a justification for it in this country and, uh, and on this land, and it continues to this day. So how do you make sense of it? Why are police, why do they care about our sexuality or our gender expression at all? Because it's a, a way of um, distinguishing be between uh, the quote-unquote good and uh, law-abiding citizen and the one who is seen as a sign of disorder. And that's particularly the case uh, in present day in New York City where we've come back to and, and are spreading this notion of order maintenance policing. So then it comes down to a question of a police officer looking at you and trying to decide whether you fit into the accepted order of things. And if your gender presents in a way that seems disorderly to them, they can't quite put you in a box or they feel like the box you're presenting is not the one they want you to be in, they're going to read that as a sign of disorder. They might walk up to you and start questioning you, feel like you're suspicious. They might literally write you a ticket for disorderly conduct, for simply appearing in public in a way that they find signals gender disorder or sexual disorder. And this sounds very theoretical, except the young people I work with literally talk about police officers saying, I wouldn't stop you if you didn't dress this way. I wouldn't ask you questions if you didn't dress like a boy. I wouldn't believe you were engaged in prostitution if you weren't dressed like that. And, and you document people arrested because they have condoms on. Absolutely. And obviously it depends where. I think that if a young white man was standing on the corner outside this studio um, with condoms, people would assume that he was uh, following good public health messaging and, and uh, doing what he needed to do to protect himself and his community. But a transgender woman of color a few blocks down and over um, will be assumed not to be following good public health messaging not to be legitimately protecting herself and her community, but rather to be intending to engage in prostitution. For people that don't live in New York, 
describe a little bit of what's going on here. On the one hand, you have, as I see it, some movement on this policy of stop and frisk with the new administration, Bill de Blasio et al. There's been some agreement that that targeting of black men in particular was wrong. There's also, though, a commitment to more community policing, so-called, to more police on the streets. Is that a solution? Is that what these folks were asking for? I think we're, we're seeing a sort of transformation of how policing is happening in New York City, but ultimately the same folks are being targeted using different tactics. And um, it's uh, reinforcing this notion of, quote unquote, broken windows policing, of order maintenance policing, the notion that small signs of disorder um, you know, detected by many officers on the street who are perceived by people in those communities as very much occupying forces, um, addressing those swiftly and and uh, surely with with uh, punishment of some kind will will prevent major um, offenses. And and it's just not been proven. One of the architects of that theory uh, discredited it, um, and it instead just turns into a means of of creating a lack of safety for other communities and. Uh, it also produces the kinds of policing, it creates opportunities for the kinds of policing of gender and sexuality in service of policing of race and poverty that we talk about in the book. It creates more opportunities for police officers to be out on the street looking at people, deciding whether they think that they're a threat, whether they're a, they're a sign of disorder, whether they're about to engage in disorder. It gives officers more tools in terms of the kinds of regulations that they're enforcing to then question, harass, target people. For instance, in my neighborhood, I've seen more um, police checkpoints. So now people are being start stopped more in their cars than on foot, perhaps on my block. But the same effect is happening, which is that people are being questioned. They're being asked to produce ID if the ID doesn't match, if or if they don't have ID because they're undocumented. Then the similar consequences mm -hmm. flow. And and so again, I think New Yorkers need to think carefully about whether these tactics are producing safety or whether they're just another form of uh, policing the same populations in the same ways that are about policing the same uh, systemic power relations. You talked about uh, ordinance maintenance offenses. Is that an official term, that a policing term? Or There's order maintenance policing. There's something called quality of life offenses. They're ostensibly about maintaining everyone's quality of life in New York City, but really they're, uh, we're not sure whose quality of life they're maintaining. And that's very different from the laws that we saw passed, uh, well, we still see passed, having to do with hate crimes. Um, you're against those, right? I'm certainly against hate crimes, and I'm also against um, hate crimes laws that are punitive in nature. When we go, when we think about other places in the world, the first thing we think about is are lesbians and gays persecuted? Is their conduct criminalized? And the next thing we think about once that issue is addressed is are lesbians and gays protected and transgender people protected by hate crime laws? But often the latter is not possible because of the former. Mm. And ultimately, if society is about policing and punishing non-conformity with gender uh, norms and sexual norms, then they're going to do so in the ways that they protect people from violence as well. So police and, and uh, other folks don't tend to change their behavior when they're uh, responding to people as victims of crime as they do when they believe them to be a sign of disorder generally. What about anti-trafficking laws that have come in for a lot of attention over the last few years? A lot of people believe we're not doing enough to crack down on sex trafficking, particularly of young girls. I think that certainly all of us are concerned about anyone being coerced to do anything that they don't want to do and certainly or not being paid for their labor. I think that there's a, a multitude of industries in which trafficking is taking place. I think we focus on one, but we could spend more time focusing on trafficking that takes place in the production of the food that we eat, um, in the production of childcare in our homes, um, and in the production of, of pretty much anything in society. Anywhere there's labor, there's trafficking. The problem with the law enforcement based responses is similar to that with hate crimes legislation. Hate, we've had hate crimes legislation for 30 years in this country and the number of incidents of violence against LGBT people hasn't gone down. Similarly, law enforcement based responses come in after the fact and often, um, as with hate crimes laws, people are perceived through the same lens by police officers who are responding to violence as police officers who are enforcing lines of race and poverty and gender. And so um, when responding to 
prostitution or perceived trafficking situations, police engage in a great deal of profiling and a great deal of uh, violence in their responses and in a great deal of um, punishment of people who they are ostensibly trying to protect. I've heard police officers say, for instance, that they, they want to break a victim of trafficking um, in order to find out who their exploiter is, when in fact, Many young people, um, research has shown, and many people generally um, who engage in the sex trade are doing so for economic reasons mm -hmm. um, and are not being coerced by any one person. And the folks who are being coerced um, are, are not in a position where that kind of law enforcement is actually going to address the issue. It's only going to further alienate them from, from seeking help, um, and it's going to further push them away from from institutions that might be able to help them get out. Um, it's also going to push them away from people in the industry that they're involved in who might be able to help. And so it's really critical that we, we look at um, and listen to what people in the industry themselves, including survivors of trafficking, are saying they need. And rarely are they saying they need uh, more police officers, and more often they're saying they need more pathways to immigration status. They need more housing. They need more economic opportunities. They need more of the things that will make them less vulnerable to being coerced into doing something they don't want to do, whether they're trafficked into the sex industry or whether they're trafficked into the agricultural industry. Are you getting any clearer about what policing is for, what we as a society are getting out of any of this other than, I guess, making some money along the way, as you described? I think policing has been used uh, to maintain existing social and economic structures for a very long time from, again, we, we talked earlier about, you know, the first colonial forces arriving and and policing the physical bodies of indigenous peoples and, and just using policing to destroy their culture and their practices and, and um, and set up hierarchies of gender and sexuality was used as a basis of taking land. And uh, the first uh, modern police forces were slave patrols. And it's clear what what the purposes were there. And, and police have been used to round up um, immigrants, uh, people engaged in the sex trades, people who are um, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender for a very long time. And, um, and now are also being used to, to round up and incarcerate uh, significant numbers of people of color. And so I think in all of those instances, it's about maintaining existing systems of, of social order. And, um, and we need to look at the ways those happen in, in macro ways and in individual police interactions. There was an interesting comment by the New York Di uh, District Attorney, Cyrus Vance Jr., uh, about a report from the Vera Institute that looks at criminal justice issues that revealed racial bias in who gets held in prison and who gets granted bail, who gets arrested or brought in, but then who gets held. Uh, and he said, it's not so much whether there is or there isn't unconscious bias, it's what we do to fix the problem. Is there anything we're doing out there that's making the situation better right now, Andrew? I think right now we're talking about it, which makes it better. I think that um, the more we can expose and surface the many different ways in which racial profiling manifests um, in the experiences of women of color or LGBT people of color, for instance, the many different ways that uh, profiling and targeting of poor people and homeless people manifest, then the more we're able to confront it and bring it uh, by bringing it to light, we can then address it. Um, I, I think that legislative change is important, but it's not uh, the be-all, end-all. It, it's actually about building movements of people who are uh, working together to make rights realities, who are working together to make rights realities on the corners of the streets of New York, in people's homes, in people's communities, um, through collective action and education. Do you see a balance where it works, where communities are safe, not just for a few, but for everybody or for most people? Um, where people feel secure, um, but at the same time there's enough fluidity that maybe a little disorder here and there isn't so bad after all. I think there's pockets of uh, opportunities that come up here and around the world where we can see communities deciding on their own account what safety looks like for everyone and making sure that it's respected for everyone. Any examples? I think there's um, examples in Brazil, for instance, or Argentina, or in many communities where law enforcement is not an option. I think indigenous communities have also um, found ways to produce safety and healing in their communities without relying on the, the state because the state has been a source of violence for them. I think many queer communities have also found ways to stay safe because uh, 
for a long time, the state wasn't even an option in terms of obtaining violence um, or addressing violence. I think in, in many countries of the world um, and in the early times of the anti-violence movement in the United States, we look to each other to create safety. We look to our communities, to our neighbors, to our families, to our friends, to our political comrades, to be accountable to each other for our safety and to, to address problems as a community rather than relying on policing and violence to do so because ultimately then that will lead to policing and violence along the lines of gender, of sexuality, of race, and of poverty. So tell us a little bit more about Safe and Streetwise, the project that you're part of, or Streetwise and Safe, um, and what you're figuring out about how to do this differently. We approach it at Streetwise and Safe three different ways. One is to make sure that young people are aware of their rights and practice strategies for addressing the realities of police encounters together. And they are the experts in those situations. They survive them every single day, so we share what we know about the law, they share with each other what they know about surviving those encounters, and together they find ways to reduce the harms of interactions with law enforcement. Um, then they also want to be parts of the conversations about what policing looks like and what safety looks like, and safety for them does not look like a flood of more police officers. That looks like more danger for them. Um, they are very clear about what they need to feel more safe and they articulate it every single day and they're demanding it every single day. And it is? More housing, more jobs, more living wage jobs, uh, more access to gender affirming health care, more access to safe spaces, uh, more access to uh, opportunity to express their gender and sexuality in the ways that um, they want to. Um, those are the kinds of things that if we just ask folks what they need, they, they will uh, articulate it. Um, and people are finding ways to keep each other safe in community because for, for LGBT youth of color, particularly who are homeless, police are not a source of safety. And so they find ways to work together to keep each other safe. And what's important in those moments is to make sure that we don't also then criminalize those efforts. And so um, the state sometimes steps in and, and makes those activities um, criminalized. Dean Spade, whom we interviewed on uh, this, these subjects of, a little while ago, talked about trickle-up justice. It's mm. a phrase I liked a lot. Uh, Dean has so many phrases. Uh, he also talks about um, distribution of life chances and and one of the things that I've really focused on in the work and what we talk about in, in the book a fair amount is how much one encounter with a police officer can change the entire course of your life and really change the distribution of life chances that you have. And what we are trying to accomplish at Streetwise and Safe is to, is to make sure that there's the harm of those encounters is minimized, um, that you, your entire life doesn't change in that moment. Um, and what we're trying to accomplish through Communities United through, uh, for Police Reform and other organizing efforts, sort of whether it's at the local, state, or federal level, is, is to make sure that's true for as many people as possible. So as many people as possible can dare to be everything that they are and bring exactly. to our society. Exactly. Andrea, thank you so much. Andrea Ritchie is one of the authors of Queer Injustice, the Criminalization of LGBT People in the United States, written with Joey Mogul and Kay Whitlock. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks so much for having me. What happened to Marsha Powell mm -hmm. while she was in prison? They put her in a cage. A female inmate at Perryville dies after being left locked up in the heat for hours. ABC 15's Mary Ellen Resendez is live with the very latest on this investigation into her death. Mary Ellen? Katie, we're just learning that three of those prison workers have been have been placed on paid administrative leave. Now all three are under investigation for the death of Perryville inmate Marsha Powell. Now we're told 48-year-old Powell was serving a 27-month sentence for prostitution when she died in custody after being left out in the heat for nearly four hours. I work with a group called Food Not Bombs. I remember serving Marsha in the park more than one time. I remember she was really nice and she treated us all really nicely and thanked us. She just wanted, you know, a little bit of sustenance, which is all anybody really wants. All I know is we got a lockdown, and then we just started hearing all kinds of stuff, you know, well, they put somebody in a cage. Um, it was a hush-hush thing. and it escorted her to the, um, the wrecking closure. And then uh, I took off the cuffs and Powell began walking around
um, the record closure. I didn't think she was going to be out there that long. And I mean a cage is like a cyclone fence in the middle of a yard with, with no roof over it. It's sun bearing down on you. That's what you get for discipline. I have seen officers, including supervisors, use that enclosure for purposes it wasn't designed for. Uh, Pal didn't look good. Dr. Johnson, he started asking questions. Hey, how long has Pal been down here? Just started asking questions. Was, and and as, as the minutes were going by, he was, I think he was getting upset. And he was talking about, you know, hey, you guys should have been giving her water. I'm telling you, if you don't have family, you don't have somebody to protect you out here, you're lost in there. And Marsha got lost. How is it that 16 people could walk by a human being who is dying in a cage in 108 degree heat, defecating on herself and begging to be let out? If it was one or two people, you got a couple of bad apples. 16 people is the man upstairs responsible. And nobody was even prosecuted. The big climate march in New York City and a big new book have concentrated attention on the climate. Enough denial and delay, the marchers chant. This changes everything, writes Naomi Klein in her latest call to action. It's not about carbon. It's about capitalism, says Klein. I couldn't agree more. It's time we faced not just the symptoms, but the system that's cozying us up to catastrophe. Our economic system of extract, exploit, and profit is colliding with our ecosystem, explains Klein. And in case anyone's unclear about the consequences of that, when the ideology of infinite growth meets the reality of finite fuel and planet, reality is the odds-on favor. We can't keep drilling and billing forever. It's a relief to see people in the streets and a relief to see crisis and capitalism in the same sentence. We heard plenty during the last recession about the crisis of capitalism. What Klein keeps us thinking about is the crisis that is capitalism. After all, only people in crisis are going to work long hours for low pay and someone else's profit. It's good to see people talking about crisis and capitalism and power. Not just fuel, but influence. The fossil fuel cartel, reports Klein, spent $400,000 a day last year lobbying Congress. And that's not criminal or corruption. It's just democracy under capitalism. All that low pay produces profit enough to spend an awful lot on propaganda and greenwashing. And the UN's climate summit seem plenty of both. While regular people have been in the streets, big business leaders have been in the suites, making all sorts of promises to self-regulate their emissions and come up with market-driven solutions like carbon trading. We saw what happened when Wall Street gambled with our homes. What do we think they'll do with our planet? The same corporations that have figured out how to profit off war are going to have the same approach to global cooling. As Klein points out, just eight huge agribusiness firms hold almost all the patents on the la latest climate-ready crops. They can't be trusted to techno-fix our farms without expecting us to pay for it. Commodities, crisis, climate, capitalism, lots of good words are in the mix. The word we need to take out and give up on is confidence. Confidence that anything but a systems change will fix this. Because what needs fixing isn't just the carbon, as Klein writes so well, it's capitalism and the concentration of wealth and power. In the hands of unnatural beings like corporations is no place, she says, to leave control over our natural resources. Right on. You can write to me, laura at grittv.org. Thanks. <laughs>